My name's Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. Tokyo, a megalopolis of 38 million inhabitants, is often described as chaotic and bewildering. The city indeed appears to be a complex web of ultra-modern buildings and small private houses assembled together like pieces of Lego, with no apparent consistency. Twice destroyed, in 1923 after a terrible earthquake, then in 1945 after the American bombardments, Tokyo has risen from its ashes each time, and since then seems to be perpetually reinventing itself in order to satisfy its insatiable need for expansion. With its 13,500 inhabitants per square meter, Tokyo is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Lack of space is a permanent problem. To deal with this, the city landscape has undergone a new transformation with the appearance of micro-homes. These ultra-small houses that rival one another in innovative design are popping up on the slightest available plot of land, however small. It's these micro-homes that offer an alternative way of living in the city that I've come here to discover. In the heart of the Shibuya district, one of the busiest in Tokyo, stands a surprising house, nestled between a car park and a building. It's that of Satoshi and his family. Satoshi, hello. Hello, Philippe. This facade is unbelievable. It's barely the width of my arms. It's very small, but it's much wider on the side. Please, come in. Thank you. Wow. Welcome. It's quite surprising because when you see the facade, you get the impression that the house is extremely narrow, whereas it's actually quite spacious inside. The living room and a garden even. I didn't expect that. It's very small, but in addition to this floor, there's also a basement and an upper floor. The place I'm most proud of is the bathroom upstairs. Thank you. Wow. This room is my pride and joy. <laughs> really? Why the bathroom? That's a bit surprising. This bathtub is like an outside bath. It has a link to the outside. It's bright and sunny here in the morning. I take a hot bath here, and then I'm ready for my work day. In the evening, I relax here. I can listen to music, birds singing, the murmur of a river, and I forget everything else. It's a wonderful place. <laughs> so this is the bedroom. The bed's gigantic. It takes up the entire room. My daughter, my wife and I all sleep together in this room. In Japan, when the children are little, we all sleep together. That's a tradition. Mm. Does that mean she doesn't have her own room? Miroku's room is in the basement. For the time being, that's where she plays her piano and trumpet and does her homework. That's what it's used for. When she gets older, she can sleep there. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required.
I'm amazed by the shape of your house. I find it incredible that houses can be built in Tokyo on such narrow strips of land. The plot measures 59 square meters, but because it's what's called a flag lot, we had to build the house on an even smaller surface, 25 square meters. If the land had had a better shape, the price would have been much higher. This land wasn't even for sale. But the owner agreed to divide it up and sell us this small plot. As a general rule, land such as this is passed down from generation to generation, and they are hard to come by in Shibuya. There haven't been any for sale here for the past 13 years. When you were told that your house would have a floor surface of 25 square meters, did you imagine ever being able to live here? At first, I thought we wouldn't be able to. But I changed my perspective. I thought of it not only as a surface, but as a space, a cube. So even if the surface is small, by superimposing levels, like Lego pieces, we can obtain a three-storied house and the 25 square meters becomes 80 square meters. With such narrow surfaces, everything needs to be very functional in order to save space, and yet you've built this house around these empty spaces, which is a bit contradictory. For us, the house wasn't just somewhere to eat and sleep. Our idea was to combine beauty and functionality in order to fully enjoy life here. Shibuya is a recent district. It's very animated and noisy. It can be a bit stressful in certain areas. But then you come back here and it's peaceful. You can relax. We've managed to combine these two aspects, and for me, that's priceless. For me, these microhouses act as switches. They enable us to connect to the urban energy, to receive its electricity, and at the same time, to disconnect from it when it becomes too intense for us. Do you want some cookies? I'll heat up some milk for you. Would you like some coffee? Oh, yes, please. It's not going to be easy. If not, tea will be fine. She's made herself comfortable. You have to press this button, the big one. She doesn't even budge. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, if I'm not mistaken, this area is the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room all at the same time. Yes, this is the kitchen, but we can conceal it behind these sliding panels. They hide the kitchen. That's very practical. So when do you decide to open or close the panels? When I have guests and the kitchen is a bit messy, I close the panels and you can't see anything. In this way, with the kitchen closed off, the living room is more elegant and we can relax. How's it going? That's right. This room is certainly very functional, but even so, wouldn't you prefer to live in a bigger space? No, not at all. My parents' house is a very old Japanese-style house. It has 13 rooms altogether. When I was a child, this big house used to scare me a bit. As a lot of the rooms weren't used, I couldn't really find my place there. Our house is certainly much smaller, but each room serves a function. Also, here, I'm surrounded by objects that are dear to me. A photo of my cats, gifts that my daughter has made for me. The things I care about are all close to me. 
And because it's small, I can surround myself with these things and feel at ease. Listening to you, it seems as if the house is really an extension of oneself, and that it's not so much the size that counts, but the way in which one feels connected to it. <laughs> this strong bond with such a small space surprises me. While it's certainly the sign of a family well-being, it also represents a form of retreat, which is hard to understand. Doesn't the small size of these houses push one more towards escaping outside? How do you have any privacy in a space that's unavoidably shared by all? Particularly when you're a young couple, how do you live in this type of house? In the working class district of Aoto, rows and rows of these modern micro houses are clustered together on a small parcel of land. Nami and one of her friends are waiting for me on the doorstep of one of these houses. Nami lives in 60 square meters with her sister and parents. She agrees to show me how she reconciles this space and her need for privacy. Hello. I see you're enjoying the sunshine. As it's a sunny day, it's nicer outside than inside. Would you like to come in? Yes, thank you. Please, come in. Thanks. Shall we go up? Yes. This is the ground floor. And this is the first floor. That's the kitchen. My bedroom's up here. This is my bedroom. There's not enough room for two people, so I'll let you go in. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's tiny. <laughs> it's small, but I only use it as a place to sleep. When I'm at home, I'm usually in the living room. So it's no problem. <laughs> You're a young, 28-year-old woman. You work, and yet you still live with your parents in a very small house. I have a hard time understanding how you live here. In Japan, it's not unusual for young people in their 20s, like me, to still live with their parents until they get married, for example. I'm not an exception. Don't you find it hard to live in such small spaces? A small bathroom, a small kitchen, a tiny bedroom? No, I'm not often at home. I usually see my friends outside, for dinner, for example. I'm only at home for family meals and to sleep. That's what this space is used for. And I'm perfectly content with that. There's still something that intrigues me. How do you have any privacy in such a confined space? <laughs> well, you see your boyfriend outside rather than at home. You can go to a love hotel, for example. A lot of people live like this, I think. If you only have a shower at home and no bathtub, and you want to take a bath, you can go to the public baths. If you can't have a cat at home, you can go to the cat cafe and play with a cat. And if it's too small at home to read, you can go to a manga cafe. We get by like this. It's there. Ah, that's it. Yes, right there. These are mangas for girls, and those are for boys. So these are for girls, and those mangas are for boys.
Over here you can take a shower. This is a girls only zone, pink. Here you can read, go on the internet. If you miss the last subway, you can also sleep here, freshen up or take a shower. Well, I'm going to read my manga now. Okay, bye. <laughs> Leaving a house where space is lacking to go read in an even smaller space seems a bit absurd to me. But for three euros an hour, these manga cafes are crowded day and night and prove that the existence of these micro houses is only possible because the city has been conceived as an extension of the home. The two are interdependent. One doesn't exist without the other. All the shops and services are in close proximity to the home. They're like an extension of it. The public squares act as the house's garden. The numerous restaurants replace the dining rooms, and the vending machines on every street corner are an annex of the refrigerator. With my eye more attuned now, I see that these microhouses are omnipresent. Faced with an urban scale of gigantic proportions and often uniform style buildings, these tiny architectural objects manage to reintroduce a human dimension to the city. The urban space becomes, in a way, domesticated, which gives a playful, do-it-yourself air to the street. I have an appointment with the architect Manabu Naya, who built one of the smallest houses in Shibuya with a floor surface of just 16 square meters. I'm hoping he'll help me get a better understanding of Tokyo's urban organization, which reconciles these two antagonistic universes, the micro-home and gigantism. What fascinates me here in Tokyo is that no two houses are alike. They're all completely different in shape and size. It's hard to understand even how they've managed to be built. You sometimes get an impression of chaos. After the Second World War, Japan was in ruins. There was almost no urban planning. But a lot of people from the provinces came to live in Tokyo. So it became a megalopolis, one of the biggest in the world. And as the price of land also shot up, people began to want to move out to the suburbs. But the commute into the city takes about an hour, or an hour and a half, just to get here. So traveling to work every day takes a long time. So people prefer to live in the city on small plots of land that belong to their family, for example, and they build vertical houses on them. There are a lot of houses of this type. But how is it possible to find such small plots of land? In Japan, the law requires the facade to be at least two meters wide in order to be able to construct. But it doesn't specify a minimum surface area. So we can find houses that have a floor surface of 15 square meters. In Tokyo, people generally want a floor surface of between 27 to 30 square meters. As a consequence, we have no other choice but to build vertically. It's surprising to see all these gaps between the houses. In a city with such a space shortage, it seems to be a waste of precious square meters. In Japan, to build a house in a residential area, the law requires there to be a minimum space of 50 centimeters between the houses. In that way, the air can circulate and some light can come in. Let's go and see the house that I built here. That one? Yes. Wow. It has three stories. Yes, there are three windows. I really wouldn't have thought it was possible to build on such a small surface. The first time I came here to meet my client, I walked straight past it without noticing it. I turned back and when I saw it, I was very surprised. It was so small I burst out laughing. Shall we go in? Yes. yes. 
This house, built over three stories, has seven split levels which act as landings around a center staircase. It's very ingenious, but Manabu wants to take me directly out onto the roof terrace. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. It's incredible. 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 There's a great view on that side, too. What's surprising out on this terrace is that you realize just how small the buildable area is, whereas when you're inside the house, you completely forget it. In architecture, there are all kinds of techniques, and it isn't just a question of calculation. In order to make a small space appear large, people need to have an impression of space. And that's what I've attempted to do here. When this house was finished and I came up here, I wasn't expecting to see such a skyline, because it's extremely rare in Tokyo. We're surrounded by tall buildings, and it's like we're on a plain in the middle of the city. We can start cooking. Micro house also means a micro barbecue, to which Satoshi has invited me. At the foot of the micro garden giving on to the sky, this is a special moment for Satoshi where he and his family can come together. It smells good. Wow, it's superb. <laughs> Thank you. A piece of sausage. Great, thanks. Mm. Do you often have barbecues? Yes. Yes, we sometimes invite friends. That's right, her friends. It's wonderful to be in the city and to be able to have a barbecue in your home. Oh, fava beans. Hey, he handles the chopsticks well. What's that? That's fantastic. It's not easy to pick up fava beans with chopsticks. In Japan, we practice using chopsticks with fava beans. Yes, it takes practice. I get the impression that your micro house in the heart of Tokyo is like a case that protects what's most precious and important to you. That's right. I wanted to create a space where my family could come together. In Japan, we have a saying that expresses this idea. Hare to ke. Ke designates the everyday. And when the everyday persists over time and tension builds up, we end up becoming polluted. To cleanse ourselves, we need a peaceful place. That's how I see this house, a peaceful place where we can feel relaxed and comfortable, a place where we're happy. That's the spirit of this house. At the end of my trip, I've gained a wealth of information from these micro-houses. Faced with a shortage of space in one of the world's biggest cities, they offer an interesting alternative between collective and private housing. But what I find most interesting is that they're the opposite of mass production, which has characterized the 20th century. These micro-houses are above all cultural objects, 
made to measure for city dwellers who no longer want to suffer the stress and inconveniences of the big city, but want to take advantage of all the resources that city life has to offer. My name's Philippe Cime. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture tells us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore the most singular habitats on the planet, to discover the meaning behind them, and to share in their riches. Day breaks over Kyoto a city with a prestige dating from the time it was the imperial capital of Japan, for more than a thousand years until 1869. Nestled at the foot of its surrounding hills, Kyoto is today a modern city, but one which has successfully been able to conserve the greatest cultural riches of Japan. With its 2,000 temples and shrines spread out across every district, the city is impregnated with the sacred. The quintessence of Japanese lifestyle can be seen in its architecture, its bridges, its gardens, and nature, which is celebrated everywhere. To me, Visiting this city is like going back in time to discover the Mashiach of craftsmen, which were townhouses constructed from the 17th century on. Built entirely in wood, intimately linked to nature, and imbued with spirituality, they perfectly reflect their city, which was composed mostly of wooden homes until the end of World War II. Although many Mashiach have been demolished since the early 20th century, these past few years have seen a keen interest in the Mirais. There are 8,000 of them still spread across the city, fixed up and lived in. I wonder if this clearly stated choice of living in a traditional residence is driven by cultural or architectural motives. Why, in the modern world, would anyone want to live in a home anchored in an ancestral lifestyle? Hi. Hello. Welcome, welcome. We were expecting you. Thank you very much. Please come in. Wonderful. Amazing. This is our garden. Amazing. This is my wife, Fumi and my son Junichiro. Hello. Nice to meet you. Please. Thanks. This way. Three years ago, Kishiro decided to live in this Mashiya where he's greeting me today. Disenchanted with uniform, over-sanitized modern architecture, he bought this abandoned townhouse and had it restored to its original style. Mashia are the result of know-how accumulated by the carpenters of the past. They're the quintessence of Japanese culture. I thought to myself, if one day I'm to own my home, I want it to be a house like this. 
Even if lots of people say that Amashia isn't very comfortable, I love discovering day in, day out, the wisdom and the smart tricks invented by our ancestors. Thanks to that, I find that the Mashia is very pleasant to live in. Do you think that these very old houses can be adapted for modern day life? With modern day objects and appliances, a Mashia is very comfortable to live in. In fact, it's a very flexible house, very easy to transform. In that sense, it's totally adapted to modern living. Keishiro takes me upstairs the most spacious part of the house and, in his eyes, the most representative, due to the fact that it can be modulated and transformed according to his needs. Beyond the functional aspects, I'm also struck by the bareness of this floor. Rooms and corridors are empty, with few objects or decoration. There's nothing here to remind you of modern daily life, it's as if I've gone back in time. What room is this exactly? This is our guest room. Philippe, you are a guest today. Would you like to stay here in our guest room? <laughs> yes, here. Very well. <laughs> and so what is this room? This is reserved for official guests. It's the most important room in the house. In fact, it's designed so that the guest has the best possible view from the room. And this space is completely adaptable depending on the situation. Exactly. For example, you can remove the sliding doors. You do it like this. You can remove them all. Yes. And all you're left with are the pillars and beams. In fact, the house is built with a very light wooden structure. And for it to resist earthquakes, it must have a very simple structure and very light furniture. A Westerner might find the house devoid of all life. But a quote from the writer, Junishiro Tanizaki, springs to mind. Beauty is given to a Japanese room by the absence of all accessories. But in a Mashiya, emptiness is merely apparent. It makes room for the essential, natural materials, simple forms and pure lines, which create an open space diffused with light. The basics of Japanese architecture are very simple. There are pillars and beams, but no actual walls. In a way, the building and nature are connected in space. Japanese design is very simple and minimalist. All superfluous decoration is absent, and a single flower decorates the empty space. That's the Japanese aesthetic. I go down to see Fumi, who practices ikebana, Japanese flower arranging. Ikebana is more than making a bouquet of flowers. What does it represent to you? Japan has four distinct seasons, so we want to introduce nature into the home by decorating it with flowers, depending on the time of year. We not only put flowers in full bloom, but also buds which are yet to blossom. And that's how we introduce time into Ekebana, and we try to represent its passing in nature. This arrangement is composed of red and white flowers, two colors of prosperity in Japan. These are because we're welcoming you as a guest today. Everything, down to the simplest gesture, is codified here. Keishiro's gardeners, who are here working this morning, also seem to have very clear directives. What are you planting today? 
This is a type of cherry tree known as Hanakaido. Narukawa san asked to plant a seasonal tree which he could admire from the living room. In the machia, the garden is just next to the living room, so that it can be contemplated from there. Unlike in Europe, we don't go into the garden to rest or for barbecue. Do you want to help us plant it? Okay. Where do I put it? Here? Yes. So I just place the moss? Yes, and without pressing down too hard. The moss will take root by itself. Why do all machia have a garden? Machias are located in densely packed spaces. So it's difficult to introduce nature here. So the presence of a garden is essential to obtaining light and a breeze, for example. I guess so, but they must exist more than just for functional reasons. Is there a symbolic dimension to the garden? Yes, indeed. This small garden is like a vast imaginary landscape. This stone symbolizes an island, as does that one over there. We use an effect of perspective to make the garden look much bigger than it really is. So the garden is more for contemplation than it is functional. Exactly. Traditionally, the garden was purely for contemplation and children weren't allowed to play in it. It was reserved for the master of the house, but that has all changed today. Now you can go out and walk on the stones. But some parts are still forbidden. You can step here, here too. This is okay. But this is forbidden. In home gardens in Europe, there are always lots of plants. Here I find it astonishing and very beautiful that there are so few plants and just a few flowers laid out in a very balanced way across the whole garden. The reason there aren't so many plants and flowers is because in the universe of a Japanese garden, the ma are very important. Ma are voids, empty spaces. Visually, ma and plants create a rhythm together in space. When you're sitting in the master of the house's spot, you feel like you're looking out onto a large tree. But if you really look there, you see a much smaller plant. All is very calculated, so you must have voids. That way, each individual plant creates a world around it, and all of these small worlds form a larger universe. If there are no ma and everything is joined together, there would only be one single universe with no perspective. What is the true meaning of ma? Ma is what you would call the off part of space, a design of emptiness. When you think of design, you think of the design of something that exists physically, but ma is the design of what does not exist. I'm astonished to see how much each part or function of a mashia is loaded with spiritual meaning. I'm starting to understand that in Japan, the concept of space is based on a philosophy in which the senses and the sacred are inseparable. It's not a matter of chance that temples and mashia are forms of architecture with wood constituting the entire structure. I head up to the wooded hills overlooking the city to visit the Buddhist temple Senyuji. Master carpenter, Tadanori Kimura is currently overseeing its restoration. Like his predecessors of bygone years, he has the necessary skills to restore both a Mashiach and an imperial temple. You're a master carpenter who restores the most sacred temples in Japan. So why are you interested in Mashiach, which are basically working class townhouses? Nowadays, constructions in wood, be it a temple, a shrine, or a house, are technically very similar. If you want to pass on traditional techniques to the next generation, the carpenters of Kyoto have to know how to rebuild anything. Restoring a temple like this one presupposes the knowledge of very old techniques. 
Regarding wooden architecture, ancient Japanese techniques reached a certain level of perfection. The farther you go back in time, the more the construction techniques are basic, but the results are extraordinary. Since antiquity, Japanese culture has embraced wood and we still continue to build with it. It's an indispensable material in our homes. In Machia, there's notably the main pillar, a huge piece of timber. Along with the spiritual heart of the house, the Tokonoma, the alcove shrine. I'm convinced that to maintain a wooden house, you must love it and take good care of it. My laborers are working on this gate, Chukushumon, because a decorative flower broke off. So now they're restoring it. If we let it deteriorate further, it would be seen as negligence on the part of the head monk. So we need to show people that we're taking care of these buildings. The philosopher Martin Heidegger said that building is not simply constructing a dwelling, it's making it live. By which he meant creating a fundamental relationship between man and the world. This notion of unity gives space its full meaning. In Kyoto, the Mashiya embodies the livable space where everything is linked, where the house is as much a way of being as an object where architecture not only serves to organize the various rooms, but also to place man at the center of his home. I'm setting up an ornament called kabuto. A kabuto is a samurai helmet. That's right. It's for Children's Day, formerly Boys' Day, when parents wished for their son's good health. First, you put this piece here, and the other piece here. Now, I'll put it in the tokonoma. Like that, everyone can see it. The passing on of this ritual to his son is one more way for Kishiro to be in osmosis with his house. Here, in front of the tokonoma, or recess, I realize that everything is designed for harmony, tradition and gesture, mind and matter. Kishiro, is this mashia built all with the same wood? No. In fact, there are a number of species used in Kyoto mashia. Take the design of this tokonoma. This is ebony. And that is cherry. We also use cedar from the island of Yakushima. But the most important part is this pillar, the toko bashira. So it's this sugi tree trunk that gives true worth not only to the tokonoma, but to the whole room. For the main pillar, we use sugi wood from the forest of Kitayama in the hills of Kyoto. It's a tree native to Kyoto with delicate folds on the surface. For this pillar, we use Kitayama suki, as it's very precious wood, and I am very proud of it. With such praises sung for this wood, I was keen to visit the cradle of this wonder tree, the mysterious forest of Kitayama. Just a few kilometers northwest of Kyoto, I finally find myself standing before these sugi trees, the cedars native to Japan. Deep within the forest, I meet forester Osama Nakata, a master of the singular art of growing these trees and producing timber for the construction of Mashiya. You hold it here. Okay. And pull downwards. Okay. Your turn. Here? Yes. And one big pull. Okay. Good job. That's excellent. (laughs) 
Amidst these trees standing at attention on the hillside, pointing to the sky, I realize that their wood is more than a future pillar or beam. It's a sensitive material that bears all the virtues that the people of Kyoto attribute to nature and to the forest of Kitayama, the oldest cultivated forest in the world. It's fantastic. How did I do? Very well. I'm pretty proud of myself. The amazing thing is, once you've removed the bark, the wood is so smooth and light. Yes, and as the tree contains water, the surface is still a bit damp. Once the bark is off, how does it dry? We leave it to dry a while in the forest, and then we cut it and take it to our depot. We have plenty of trees drying out in our depot. Shall we go see? Okay, let's go. On the way to his village, Nakata-san tells me why Sugi wood became so precious. In the 16th century, the greatest tea ceremony master in Japan, Senrikyu, was seeking to perfect his art. And on discovering the Sugi, found that its paleness and softness would be the absolute refinement and represented in his eyes the aesthetic ideal of a tea house. Like all the master foresters who preceded him in his village, Osamu Nakata has continued to improve his technique to obtain this aesthetic ideal. These are sugi trunks after being polished. They're the end product. They look so light, but I couldn't carry one for long. <laughs> Will all these trunks be used for building machia? No, the trunks used in machia are these ones. They're used as pillars in the tokonoma. Their purpose is to highlight what's on display so the tokonoma stand out. That's the most important role of these trees. Without sugi, the objects displayed in the tokonoma wouldn't appear so beautiful. That's the role these trees play. This way. We're sanding down the trunk with real sand. It's sand that you can find only at the bottom of a pool beneath a waterfall called Bodai no Taki. The grains are very fine and break up easily. Since the olden days, this sand has been used to sand and polish sugi. Can I try? Sure, try with my mother. Okay. Go ahead. Mama, could you show him how? Okay, I take some sand. Take a handful of sand, put it on the trunk, then rub. Like this? Yes. And then I rub. That's right. It's like massaging the wood. See how it cleans the surface of the trunk? It becomes all smooth. You smooth out all the rough patches, and you can still feel the veins in the wood. It's very sensual. Let's put it in the tank. Okay, let's do this. It's marvelous. Is this the final stage? Yes, it is. This one will now get married. Married? What do you mean? It's going to get married. Since forever here, when we give the trunk its last wash, the final step, it means there's a buyer. So we say, this one's getting married. It's as if we were talking about our darling daughters leaving the home to get married. When I watch how you work, I think the things we make are quite similar. When you take care of them, they also take care of you. As night falls across the valley, the close links which unite the elements of the Japanese lifestyle finally become clear. Everything seems to have its place, from mountain to town, from wood to house, from matter to mind.
There's rice on top and egg custard underneath. Enough for six people. Can we serve it all? Yes, and that's the sauce for the tempura. Back at Keishiro's house, a surprise awaits. Following the strict rules of tradition, a typical meal is served in the large room upstairs to wish the guest of honor farewell. It's magnificent, really magnificent. Thank you so much. It's a traditional Japanese meal. It looks delicious. And I adore Japanese food. Let's go. Better understanding the way this house is used, I take full advantage of the event. Equipped, like my guests, with a small cushion and a low table which constitute the evening's furniture, I feel at one with the spirit of the room and the moment. Can't you sit cross-legged? You mean this isn't right? No, only women sit like that. Oh, okay, I'll change. <laughs> As my visit comes to an end, the moments of daily life shared with Kishiro and his family leave me with a feeling of having tested a rare lifestyle which implies discipline and constraint, but which also depends on a constant attention to each moment in the construction, to the materials, to nature, and to everyday gestures, even the most banal. I also believe that living in a Mashiach is much more than merely living. It's adopting a lifestyle elaborated down the centuries which shows all the subtle forms of interaction between the individual and his environment. My name's Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. I'm in Papua, part of the Indonesian archipelago, at the heart of an impressive rainforest, crossed by a river on whose banks stand trees that reach 40 meters in height. This very isolated province in the southwest of West Papua is home to the Kurawai, a Papuan people who live deep in the jungle. They are known as the tree men. It's a three-day journey from Jayapura city to their clan. Airplane, canoe, then a day's walk through this swampy region. To adapt to this hostile environment, the Korwai have treated the forest not as an adversary, but as an ally worthy of their respect. There, they found protection and a source of life. Totally unknown before 1975, their numbers are estimated at around 3,000 scattered in clans of 10 to 20 individuals. But even today, many of them have not been registered yet as they are so difficult to locate. Deep in this jungle, rendered almost impenetrable by the lianas and many understory layers, I'm about to meet one of them, Marcus. Marcus. Hello. 
I'm happy to be here, finally. I've been waiting for you, and you finally arrived. I'm glad. This is where I live. Who lives here with you? Just my family, my wife and my children. Come with me and I'll show you. Thank you. It's impressive. Marcus seems to have no trouble moving along the tree trunks that cover the ground. Now I understand the origin of their name. Korowai means he who has strong legs. Marcus's clan lives in this clearing. It is composed of his family, his wife, his brother, his aunt, and several children. To them, the forest seems to be a second body that binds them all and that separates them from the rest of the world. But how do they live in isolation, in such an inhospitable territory where resources are limited? How do they live in this huge forest? Among this cluster of homes, one very impressive dwelling is perched atop a tree. How do you climb up here? Can you show me? I always use the little ladder, but you're big and strong. You need something more solid to climb. Uh -huh. I see. You only use your toes. We climb like this when the houses are very high. You have to dig your toes in here. The elders used to do this, and we do the same. Okay. Sure, but you have to be very agile. Uh -huh. I'm sure you could do it like me. But for safety's sake, I'd rather use the ladder I built for you. I'm used to it, you're not. I'm afraid you might fall. Well, I don't want to fall either. It's a long way down. You're very big, so I'm going to strengthen the ladder again and bind it very, very tightly. Marcus, do you sing to give yourself strength when you work? If I don't sing, I don't have any strength. Singing motivates me and gives me courage. If you don't sing, my ladder won't be finished. Don't worry, the chief has come to help me. I'll try the steps, not to the top because I'm too scared, but at least halfway to see if I can climb. You can't go up like that. First, you must take off your shoes. I was going to take off my shoes, but nothing else. <laughs> I've done my best. Oh, the ladder wasn't completed? Thank you. Merci. When it comes to choosing the site or the various construction materials, Marcus takes advantage of the forest's diversity to make the best use of it. This treetop house, surrounded by huge trees, feels like a refuge. Luckily, you built the ladder for me or I wouldn't be here. Thank you. It's incredible being here at this height.
You really can see the whole forest. That's what I like about living in a high house. The landscape is beautiful, and above all, there's lots of fresh air. What height is the house built at? I can't measure like you. I was told about meters, but I don't know what they are. I'd say around 10 times my size. I'd say 10 to 15 meters. Yes, 15 meters. How do you choose the height at which to build your house? <laughs> you ask me, but I don't know. When I build, it's instinctive. But why do the Kurawai build high-altitude houses? There are lots of reasons our houses are so high. Firstly, because the landscape is prettier from up above. But above all, it protects us from being attacked by animals. <laughs> The house is also protected from the damp, because when it rains, the forest can be flooded. And finally, the house is lighter, and we can see very far. Sure, you can see a long way. But what exactly are you looking for? I can see enemies coming, as well as evil spirits. If they come, I cut the ladder. How was the house built? The leaves you see up there are sago leaves. Those ties come from a plant called mangkok, and the wood is called buwa. This one. What's unsettling is, from up here, you can see the house moving, which isn't always very reassuring. But at the same time, you can feel it's very solid. Oh, you're right. It does move. I'm hanging on for dear life. Don't worry, it's solid. It holds even if I move like this. How many people can it take? A new house like this one can take 20 to 25 people with no problems. It's solid, it won't collapse. What surprises me here is that there are two fires. One is for the men's space, another for the women's space. So the men and the women don't occupy the same space in the house. When men and women use the same fire, they argue. So now each has their own fire. Marcus, we're sitting on the border between the men's space and the women's space. I hope things will go well. <laughs> Where's the central tree that supports everything? Are we sitting on it now? Here it is, underneath. Can you see? Oh yes, I see it. It's here. We can see it. We're tearing off the floor, here. Don't break everything. Okay. So, so here we see the trunk, and it's tied directly at the top of the tree. It's impressive. Very impressive. This is the house's main foundation. The whole house is built around this trunk. It's attached very tightly so the house won't fall down. If it wasn't attached like this, it might collapse. When you see the thickness of the trunk, you can see it's solid. All the wood is very dense, very hard. And there's an elaborate hanging system where everything is tied on very firmly. I've seen a lot of houses in my life. But this is the first time I've seen a house built in a tree like this where such a technical know-how is at work. I think I'd be as amazed as you if you showed me how you build your home. I think I'd be more than surprised. The difference is, I don't know how to build my home. Someone did it for me. Among the Korowai, if you don't build your own home, you're seen as lazy.
How do you make sure the house is balanced because the main tree isn't in the center? That's right. The central pillar wasn't enough. So right at the start, I planted this one and that one and so on. If I hadn't, the house would have fallen down. <laughs> but how do you make sure it's stable? When I was young, my father used to take me to build houses. He taught me that you need at least three poles for it to hold. Marcus's eldest son has gone to seek a wife in the neighboring clan. Before he returns, as each time the clan grows in size, a new home must be built. This one is to be built in a tree in a clearing near that of Marcus. Oh. That's a magnificent tree. How did you choose it? This tree would be perfect for a tree house because I can see that its wood is solid. With this tree, I wouldn't need any others to support the house. This can carry a whole house. It's not just because it's solid. Others in the forest are solid. There are lots of hardwood trees, but this one could continue to grow and become more solid. Are you free to choose any tree in the forest to build a house? This tree belongs to me. It stands on my land. Do you know the limits of your land? My land extends to the brook down there and to the other near the mountain. Residing in a living tree involves a relationship with nature that is not driven by the will to dominate it, but by a desire to be attentive and to live according to its rhythm. With due respect, but with great efficiency, the Kurawai take advantage of its constraints as its natural resources. Astonished, I watched the first phase of the construction of their home. After climbing up with unparalleled agility into the tree canopy, they prune all of the branches in order to lay the future floor of their home. In five days, it will be finished. I leave the men and join Marcus's wife, Gabriel, in one of the clan's dwellings. Who? You, the wife, and the children live in a lower house. That's how it is traditionally. The women on the ground and the men up in the house. I stay down here to sleep with the children, my son Sony, Maoma, my daughter, and Moatan. Is your home this house, this village, or the entire forest? The whole forest is my home. Before, I lived far away, towards the mountain. We had to leave the house because it was rotting. So we made a new house further away. That's how it is each time. When the house rots, we look for another tree to build another house. The forest has no limits. My husband wanted to find a tree here because his parents lived here and I followed him. I'm mostly down here with the children. They're still small and it's dangerous. Marcus stays up there. 
I am totally lost in this forest. I have no markers. How do you manage to orient yourself, to know which season it is? The banana trees grow all year round. I plant them and watch them grow. They give me bananas almost all year round. In the dry season, I know there are turtles that come and lay their eggs in the sand down there. My parents always used to take me there when I was young. It's thanks to them that I know. I know that when the turtles lay, the red fruit season begins. That's how we know which season it is. For the rest, I watch nature every day to see if something has grown, something the children and I could eat. I understand how the Kurwai habitat isn't only limited just to their dwellings, but merges with the surrounding territory. Here, nothing is really ritualized. Their home is just a shelter, and everything happens from day to day depending on their needs. This morning, I go with Marcus's family to cut a sago palm, the tree needed to build the new house. The bark will be used for the floor and the walls, and the leaves for the roof. What can I do? I'll give you a machete and we could do it together. Huh? That's good. Huh? What do we cut? This? No, you wait for me and I'll cut it down. You stay there and watch. And when the tree falls, run with me. Okay, I'll run fast. Do we take it all off? That's it, it's okay. Okay. That's okay. That's good. What do we do now, Marcus? Now we wait. It's the women's turn to work. Not bad. The men usually fell trees and strip the bark, and the women do the rest. We finished. <laughs> No part of this tree is wasted. The flesh of the sago palm, rich in protein, is vital to the survival of the Kurawai. Their daily lives are structured around its harvest and preparation. The content of one tree is enough to feed two or three families for a whole week. ¿Qué
What would happen if there were no more sago trees? My parents told me that if there were no more sago trees, there'd be no more water or sun. It would be the end of the world. For the last few years, the Indonesian government has been building new villages along the riverbanks to incite the Kurawai to leave the forest. Many youngsters don't hesitate to leave their clan. Dalil, you're the clan chief, but how far does your clan extend? So far, I haven't met any other families. There are fewer and fewer clans to watch nowadays because a lot of old people have died. And they were the ones who stayed in the forest. The young ones don't stay. They go off to other villages. Why do so many youngsters leave the forest to settle in the city? Once in the village, they discover new things. They discover electricity and with it electric lights. And after that, they don't want to come back. In fact, when they go down to the village, Mabul, they taste rice, tea, coffee and other flavours they'd never have known in the forest. Then they go further and further away in search of noise and light. They taste all that, it's true, but they also learn to dress and come into contact with outsiders who want to come and see the village. And what the two old guys omitted to tell you is that they also taste women. So why would they come back? There are no girls in the forest. <laughs> When it comes to leaving the Kurwai, I realize how much my encounter with Marcus has transformed me, full of joy and astonishment. For a time, I shared the life of a man who was born, has been living, and will no doubt die in his forest. I find his determination to stay there both troubling and reassuring, as it shows that his home, well beyond any treetop constructions, is the whole forest, a limitless home that cannot be known in just one lifetime. My name's Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. I'm on the island of Sulawesi, 300 kilometers from Borneo. It's the fourth largest of the 17,000 islands of Indonesia. It's here that live the Toraja, an ethnic group of 450,000 people. Most of them are Christians and have animist beliefs officially known as the Way of the Ancestors. At a time when most ethnic groups are being integrated and disappearing, the Toraja amaze many by their firm attachment to their traditions. These can also be seen in their architecture. The Toraja have developed a dwelling that is unique in the world. Far from being a simple hut, it's the material expression of their cosmogony, a vision of the world entirely built around the role of their gods and their ancestors. These unique dwellings, which are practically identical and found across the region, are called Tonkonen, 
which means the place where you sit. The Tonkinen is the heart of Tarajan life. It's firstly a house, but strangely, it's also a dwelling place for the dead. In the village of Buntu Pune, I'm meeting Ting Ting. In his family, the job of architect has been passed on from father to son. But Ting Ting is also a Toparenge, a chief whose role is to maintain not only over the houses themselves, but also the rituals performed inside them in the form handed down by their founding ancestor. Hello, Philippe. Hello. These are amazing houses. I'm totally awestruck by the roof, which seems to occupy all of the space. But at the same time, it seems to have merely been placed on wooden posts. When you look at the Torajan houses, they look like ships about to set sail. Our ancestors arrived with these houses, and once they had settled on this land, they added a roof. But originally, they were ships ready to sail. What do you mean, ready to sail? We don't live eternally in this world. Likewise, a place is never eternally occupied. So, our houses are prepared for departure, physically, but also spiritually. The amazing thing about the roof is the curve. Why is it like that? Torajan houses have a roof curved like the horns of a buffalo to let in sunlight. Torajan must be parallel to the world's axis so that the rays of the sun always rise to the east of the house and set to the west of the house. The structure of the house looks very light. There are just wooden supports, and the roof is made of layers of bamboo. It looks very simple. But a tonkonan is very difficult to build, if only for the materials. Although the inside is quite small, you need 32 cubic meters of wood, and about 20 cubic meters of wood for the roof. So it looks simple, but in fact it's quite complicated. The entrance is pretty narrow. The contrast between the exterior and interior puzzle me. Whereas the exterior is impressive with its rich ornamentation, the interior is kept extremely bare as a sign of modesty. How many floors does a Tonkonen have? This particular Tonkonen has three rooms. This room is shared by the grandmother and the teenagers. In the middle is the kitchen, which is also where the family eats. And to the south, over there, is the parents' and young children's room. Is there also a symbolic organization of the space inside a Tonkonan? The grandparents and grandchildren are in the front part of the house, in the same room, to signify that grandparents are close to death. That way, the grandchildren understand that and prepare themselves for this death. Mm -hmm. 
The parents and the young children are in the room above the buffalo stable. The stable is there to remind parents that they have a great responsibility towards their ancestors. But also to their descendants, the children, and the whole family that shares the Tongkonan. You give great importance to the orientation of the house. Is it the same thing inside? Tongkonan are loaded with meaning. Everything must be aligned with the axis of the world. For example, according to Torajan philosophy, as long as we are in good health, we sleep with our head to the north. To the north. When we die, until the funeral takes place, we are considered as being sick. So our head is pointed to the west. It's only once we're buried that our head is pointed to the south. To the south. Does that mean that north symbolizes life and south symbolizes death? Yes, that's right. The north gives life. And as the north gives life, it's only natural that the south brings death. Ah, here's a bedroom. Ah. So here, the bed is pointed to the east, neither north nor south. Why is that? In fact, it's because the door's over there, but we turn the mattress at night. Ah, I thought there was something. Shall we put it back like this? Yes, it should be kept like that. Otherwise, your head will be facing the wrong way. We never sleep with the head here. Look at that mattress over there. Okay, I see. So when I go to sleep, it's like that. Right. We've brought order back. Behind the Tonkinen, away from prying eyes, I discover much more modern homes where the families of Buntu Pune actually seem to live. So does the Tonkinen still represent to them a living architecture, or does it merely have a patrimonial purpose? The building behind us isn't really a house for the Toraja, it's more of a kitchen. The kitchen used to be inside the Tonkonan. But we can't do too many activities in there. We don't eat regular meals there or store our clothes and belongings. That's why we move the kitchen area out back. But lots of people think it's an actual house because it's the same size. So the Tonkanan still has the central place in your lives? Yes, of course. The Tonkanan is still the center of our lives. I'm invited to share a meal with Ting Ting's family. It's a chance to gather inside the Tonkinen, where the important events in life take place. What's striking is, not many people really live inside the Tonkinen, and everyone has built new houses behind. Actually, we haven't completely abandoned the Tonkonan, only some parts of it. The parents no longer sleep upstairs, but it's still used. There are people who still sleep there, because if we abandon the Tonkonan and nobody sleeps upstairs, it would fall into ruin very quickly. We don't think of the Tonkonan as having a purely material purpose. It also has a very important role in society. In fact, the Tonkonan is central to our beliefs. It's the center of family bonding and the source of our community's rules. 
This house is like a mother. And if you lose your mother, you're an orphan. If the Tonkonan were to disappear from the planet, then our links with our parents and other family members would disappear too. So we must preserve them. If you closely observe the Tonkinen, there's a surprising paradox that emerges. Constructed with heavy materials, these houses with their massive silhouettes do indeed seem ready to sail away. The pillars, framework, and buffalo-horned roof give the building incomparable lightness. I come to understand that the Tonkinen is more than a technical and architectural feat. It firstly represents man's relationship with the world or more exactly, to the universe of the Toraja, built around the presence of their gods and ancestors. To them, the facade is the interface between the gods and the community of mortals, where everything acts as a portal to the beyond. Each color has a meaning. Red symbolizes blood and thus life, white for the bones, yellow for the gods, and black for the darkness. This facade is magnificent with its buffalo head. We place a buffalo head on the Tonkonan to symbolize the limits of human wisdom. We consider the buffalo to be the example to follow as it is wiser than we are. But there's always a divine symbol above it. And how do you choose what decoration to use on the facades? These symbols represent our ancestors. And the buffalo head represents the very first of our ancestors to build a tonkonan. The facade is obviously richly decorated, but the ornamentation isn't the same. Torajan houses are all different. It depends on the social ranking of the families within the Torajan community. This Tonkonan was built in the 1870s, and its grandeur, strength, and richness tell you that it belonged to someone of great importance. These paintings mostly represent force. The facade of a Tonkinen is a bit like a book that tells the story of your clan's lineage. That's right. The layout of the decoration and carvings must correspond to the founder and descendants of the family that owns a Tonkonan. The village has an incredible sense of symmetry. If you cut a Tonkonan in two, either lengthwise or widthwise, you would discover exactly the same proportions in both halves. But I'm also struck to see how perfectly aligned the Tonkinen are. Here, everything is symbolic and conveys a meaning. For the Toraja, the house symbolizes the mother. Everything inside it belongs to her. It's as if we were inside the mother's womb. It's a way of reassuring ourselves that the regeneration of life is going smoothly. Respect towards the mother is very important to the Toraja. And this little building is a grain store. Yes. It's the rice store. It's much smaller. For the Toraja, it symbolizes the father. If there's a problem, we traditionally gather here to discuss it. 
So the mother is represented by a much larger tongkanan. But the role of the father, represented by the rice store, though smaller, is equally important because it's used to solve problems outside the house. You meet under the building that symbolizes the father to discuss and sort out common problems. If there are questions concerning marriage or divorce, they're settled on the east side of the rice store. But if they involve a crime or a death, discussions take place on the west side of the tongkonan. Wherever the Toraja live, they build tongkonan, not only for the living, but also for the dead. These houses are where the deceased lie in state while awaiting their final resting place. I visit a neighboring village where a funeral ceremony is being prepared. Nene Mambe, who is in charge of the event, explains the meaning behind the ceremony to me. Everything's a work in progress here. Yes, people are here for the ceremony of the dead. And this is the house of bodies. Why is the roof the same as on a Tonkinan? The home of the living and the home of the dead are built in the same way, so they look alike. Living or dead, it's the same shape. How many people are you expecting to show up? When it's an important family, thousands come to pay their respects. Thousands of people for a funeral. It's a big event in Tarajan life, and all in the same space. Yes, that's how Torajan belief is. It's life, it's death. All these constructions are built to honor one single person. In Tarajan culture, the higher a person's social rank, the bigger the debt he amasses during his life. On his death, the whole family must come up with the money to pay off his debts and be able to bury him. The process is long. It can take months, even years, and generally requires the selling and sacrifice of a number of buffaloes to offer the deceased a funeral worthy of his rank. These ceremonies are incredibly expensive. But the living accept having to go into debt themselves for the sake of the dead and organizing their own lives around them. After the ceremony, which lasts for 10 days, the deceased is finally taken to his final resting place. In the cemeteries, the dead are placed in a coffin, which are also in the shape of a tonkanan. But stranger still, the dead are sometimes inserted directly into rocky cavities or caves in the cliff face. The Toraja have several types of cemeteries. Before we started using natural caves, bodies were placed in wooden tombs, like this one. One for an entire family. It's also a cemetery, as you can see. There are skulls. It's the same family. This used to be a cemetery. They used to place the whole family inside the wooden tomb called an eron. 
These days, as we use one coffin per body, we place the whole family in one cave. Seeing these coffins and skeletons gives me the creeps, but they don't have the same effect on Ting Ting, for whom their presence is both reassuring and benevolent. As if his far off ancestors were keeping watch over the living from the beyond. They're stacked up one on top of the other. Some at the top, some at the bottom. They're placed one on top of the other according to the order of death. There are more on the sides. Ah, yes, up there. Here, these ones are the oldest. Oh, yes. Pretty impressive. But you don't know who's who. The coffins are a bit haphazard. As we are buried by clan, the Toraja know that their grandfather, grandmother, aunts, uncles, children, nephews, cousins, etc. All are here. This cemetery is amazing. With all these coffins piled up alongside each other directly within the rock. Who's buried here? This is the cemetery of the Londa clan. It's been used for 40 generations. And all stacked up like this. We used to bury our dead in large wooden tombs used for the entire family. But as large pieces of wood became harder to find, we started using natural caves like this one. Are the caves all near the bottom, or are there some even higher up the cliff? Families are made up of numerous clans. And each clan, like the Londa clan, has its own cemetery. Some are low down, but others are higher up. That way, each clan has its own cave. So in fact, this cliff is the Tonkonan of the dead. Yes, it's a Tonkonan, a Tang Merabu Tonkonan, a smokeless Tonkonan, which means that there's no activity here linked to life. So it's not only the living who have a Tonkonan, the dead do as well. The Taraja embody a way of living which is striking by its extreme coherence. Everything has meaning, and things seem to respond to each other, living and dead, human beings and gods. The Tonkinen, much more than a simple dwelling, is what holds together these elementary powers to form a world. A world in which the Taraja have found their place, within a much larger universe. Philippe Simet. I'm a philosopher and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. With its 7 million inhabitants, Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, is one of Southeast Asia's most vibrant and booming cities. With its shady avenues, its lakes, and its old shopping district, Hanoi's urban landscape reflects a blend of different eras. Yet, it has managed to retain its identity.
Hanoi is located in the northern part of the country, in the Tonkin region of the Red River Delta. To get a better idea of its treasures, diversity, and in particular, its singularity, I set out to explore its tunnel houses. These amazing dwellings are located in the heart of the old quarter. Combining trade activity and family life within the same space, they're the symbol of the centuries-old values of Vietnamese society. The unique feature of these houses is their narrowness. Buildings with facades measuring three to five meters wide and with a depth of between 10 to 20 meters, sometimes five stories high. How are these apparently spatially constrained dwellings inhabited and occupied? Tuan, 34, is a jeweler. His family has lived in a tunnel house for four generations in the old shopping district known as 36th Street. Tuan? Hi. Hello, how are you? Very well. Thank you for welcoming me into your home. Is this your workshop here? Yes, it's both my home and my workplace. The front part is the entrance area and also the workshop. Is this the width of the room? It can be more than two meters wide. It's a bit narrow, yes, but it's very long. The length enables us to divide the space up into different private areas. Hello. This is my grandmother and my aunt. This is Philippe, a French friend. Pleased to meet you. And that's my baby son in bed there. This room is my grandmother's. This is where she sleeps. But it's also a living room and a dining room. Yes, I noticed that the entrance was both the workshop and the place where you park your scooters. And this is the space where you eat and where you sleep. In a tunnel house, each room has to be multi-purpose. We need to be able to eat, relax, and sleep in the same space. Be careful. This is our kitchen. OK. That's the bathroom and toilet. I'll be careful. Ah, so it doesn't just extend backwards, but upwards, too. How many floors are there? My uncles built these three extra floors. Our house hasn't always been like it is now. The workshop part at the front already existed, but this back part used to be a flat roof. They used to dry the washing on it. But my uncles got married, and they needed extra rooms. So after they built them, they kept this space as a light shaft. <coughs> You see up there? These openings provide ventilation for the rooms. As in most tunnel houses, the kitchen used to be an open courtyard. But in order to gain space, the family built on it. Today, only the staircase enables air and light to penetrate inside the house. Not a very comfortable situation when you have seven people living in a space that's only 2.4 meters wide and 22 meters long. Tuan's house is like a family tree. The old people are at the bottom, while the younger ones gravitate upwards. Each generation gains a floor. I'll show you my room. Mind your head, the space is a bit cramped here. You have to be very careful. That used to be my room when I was little. Ah, OK. After I got married, we built this part as a sort of private apartment. 
And this is my domain now. It used to be the terrace. With a drying area, a garden, an aviary. After I got married, it became my bedroom so that I could have my own private space without having to leave the family. In order to understand how tunnel houses developed, we need to understand the structure of the Vietnamese family system where several generations live under the same roof. Philippe, you need to understand that the tunnel house is an age-old tradition here. Like a living entity, it needs to grow. My children and I, we are the fourth generation. The house has to adapt just as we do. Our tradition is founded on the principle that the children have to take care of their parents. We have to live together from generation to generation. So we stay together in the tunnel house and modernize it by adding floors. As I stroll through the corridor of 36 streets, I realize that the tunnel houses aren't necessarily inhabited by a single family. Many of them have been divided up into lots in order to house a growing population. It's as if the city had been cut up into thin slices, then into small pieces, with the inhabitants attempting to make the most out of the little they have. For the inhabitants of these tunnel houses, air and light are a real luxury. By way of patios and garden terraces, they attempt to escape the constraints of these confined spaces. Through the country's colonial past and the dark years of communism, these houses have survived the test of time. Despite their limitations, they carry the memory and identity of this city and its turbulent history. Trinh Duc Chin, a photographer and history enthusiast, has been observing Hanoi's evolution for a number of years. With his help, I'd like to understand the origin of these tunnel houses and the manner in which they've shaped the heart of the city. Hanoi was originally a royal citadel built by an emperor. But how do you live in a citadel? The king and mandarins needed to feed and clothe themselves. That's how the tea, the market, came into existence. Craftsmen such as tailors, blacksmiths, cooks, etc., set up shop on the streets, offering their services to the inhabitants of the citadel, but also to the general population who lived on the outside. So in the beginning, a lot of Hanoi's inhabitants were country people who moved to the town. What did they do here? When they arrived in Hanoi, the craftsmen from the countryside grouped together according to their village of origin. They all practiced the same craft. So you'll find quarters dedicated to one particular craft, utensil repairing, carpentry, etc. The local farmers satisfied the food needs of both the royal court and the general population. And that's how the city was born. You have the market, the streets, and each street is occupied by a guild that corresponds to a given craft.
The old quarter has evolved, but its spirit has remained the same for centuries. Trade activity and family life are closely linked. Just as in the past, the street names reflect the unique trade that's carried on there. Basket Street, Money Street, Fabric Street, etc. Here we're in Pharmacist Street, in the central trade district in the very heart of Hanoi. We Vietnamese like to live in this type of quarter, in old-style streets like this. It's the same with our choice of medicine. We prefer our traditional medicinal plants that are suited to our metabolism. This quarter is like a slice of life in old Hanoi. I see, but how do you explain the narrowness of the storefronts? It's because when the people came here from the countryside, they divided up the plots of land on both sides of the street into very small lots on which they built temporary shacks. As their business developed, they built more solid buildings. These lots are two or three meters wide, four meters maximum, but their length is almost limitless. There's a Vietnamese proverb which says, when you're inside a watermelon, you curl up in a ball. When you're inside a squash, you stretch out. That's exactly how it is with tunnel houses. At the front is the shop. At the back, stretching out lengthwise, are the living quarters, the light shaft, the kitchen, the toilets, etc. The formula is unchangeable. You've been photographing Hanoi for a long time. Have you seen any changes in these tunnel houses? Of course, the city is evolving and growing, but this old quarter, which is its soul, needs to stay the same. Each house preserves the spirit of the family, the ancestors, childhood memories. This explains why people don't like to transform them. Of course, we'll add modern conveniences, such as air conditioning, modern sanitation facilities, etc. But we remain very attached to tradition, to everything that reminds us of our ancestors. Hanoi's old buildings are modest in size, but they house the soul of the city, the soul of the historic capital of the city of dragon taking flight. A little farther along the street, Trinh Duc Chin introduces me to his friend, Tong. It's here? This is Philippe. Hello, pleased to meet you. Philippe, this is the owner of the pharmacy. Welcome, come inside my house. Which way, there? Wow, it's deep, isn't it? It stretches back a long way. This corridor is incredibly narrow. And with no windows? What's in there? What's this? That's our storeroom. Okay. Ah, oh, yes, everything's here. All the herbs and plants. Hello. Amazing. And it continues on. And there's a second corridor here. It just goes on forever. Are we still in the same house here? Yes, we're still alongside the house. It has a total length of 100 meters. Incredible. We're passing through the entire block. We've arrived. Please, after you. Ah, yes. It's here. It's really surprising how narrow this house is. It's 3 meter 50 wide. Okay. On each floor, I have two rooms with a total surface area of 50 square meters. Please, go on in. What's in here? Great. Fantastic. This is the terrace. What a fantastic view. You have a view over the whole neighborhood. Is this garden terrace a way of recreating the courtyards that used to exist in the early tunnel houses? It's a tunnel house, but as you can see, 
There's light, it has ventilation, and it is calm. I'm very happy with it. It's very pleasant. These tunnel houses that appear to me to be very constrained dwellings in fact reflect the high social status of their owners. Over time, their value has increased considerably. Today, the price per square meter varies between $30,000 and $50,000. These houses represent both social status and success. Li Tongqi, a young architect, designed his home based on a modern reinterpretation of the tunnel house. Hey. Hello, it's Philippe. May I come in? Hi, Philippe. Hi, how are you? Very good. Wow, what a great place you have. In fact, you've created a sort of contemporary tunnel house. Exactly. When I designed the plans, I wanted to break away from the traditional model of the tunnel house. I wanted to have a tree inside. My main objective when designing this house was the light. By letting light into his house, Li Tong Ki has transformed this space into both a living and leisure area. Ah, great. This is where I work read, and play music sometimes. It's great to wake up and have natural light. Sometimes I don't even need to go outside. I can work up here and then go down to the first floor and have coffee or breakfast, then come back up here and continue working. You renovate and build tunnel houses. How do you see the evolution and future of this type of house? It's very difficult to develop a sector of tunnel houses. The tunnel house doesn't satisfy the needs of modern life. It's a place made solely for basic things. Sleeping, eating, watching TV. In most people's minds, it's a place for doing trade and business. And for this, the tunnel house is perfect and has been for generations. This is how the old quarter of Hanoi was born and still continues to exist today. While the enduring nature of the tunnel houses halts urban development in the old quarter, it nonetheless gives it its vitality. It blurs the line between the street and the home, as if the street were the natural extension of the domestic space. It's not easy to cross. You just have to go, in fact. For urban planner Le Coq Un, it's precisely this porous boundary between private and public life, between home and trade activity, that distinguishes Hanoi as a city. What I particularly like about this place is seeing all these different trade activities spread out on the pavement like this. Yes, in fact, the activities you see on the pavement are an extension of the activities inside the house. You have the inhabitants who need more workspace for their activity, and so extend out onto the pavement. And you have other tradesmen who come here from the countryside, from elsewhere, and who want to set up shop here. Yes, you can see that all the available space is taken over. You have the shops, you have people cooking vegetables here, you have all these scooters too. Exactly. Everyone mixes together. Yes, everyone mixes together. And you don't actually walk on the pavement, you walk in the middle of the street. Yes. 
but it all works well together. When I first arrived here, I said to myself, I'll never be able to walk in the streets with all these scooters everywhere. But in fact, after half an hour, you manage to get around easily without feeling threatened. You're right in the middle of the traffic, and in fact, there's no problem. Yes, there's no problem. And this becomes the particular picture we have of Hanoi, the typical image of Hanoi. These tunnel houses have created a city model that's very compact and mixed, in fact. Exactly. Hanoi's urban life, with its social and functional diversity, its mixture of architectural styles, is what makes up Hanoi's charm. Yes, it's funny seeing those two buildings side by side like that. Yes. The juxtaposition of eras and styles. Yes. It's wonderful, and the height, too. What I find really incredible here is the permanent intermingling of everything. There are power lines everywhere, scooters, people, and all this creates a particular atmosphere. And the noise level is quite impressive, too. That's right. At first sight, you just seek a kind of disorder, urban disorder. But it functions very well, in fact. All these different things all mixed together manage to function very well. For me, that's what urban life is. I mean, when you arrive here, it all looks very chaotic, but then you soon realize there's a form of self-regulation. Exactly. And all these things work very well together. It's dynamic. That's right. The effervescent activity of Hanoi city center doesn't stop at nightfall. Between the scooters, in front of the houses, the pavements are covered with a multitude of small stands. Hey, Tuan. Oh, hi. How are you? What a surprise. Ah, great. I'm selling ban bao, steamed buns, a traditional Vietnamese dish. Sit down here. OK. This is an extra job I have outside my main work as a jeweler. This evening work brings me in a little extra income. So you sell these small buns out here just in front of your house? In fact, the pavement doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the state. But as we're short of space, we're forced to come out onto the pavement just in front of the shop. So do you manage to sell many of your little buns? Would you like to try and sell some? OK. Can you show me what to do? Well, first of all, stand here. Before selling, you need to know the menu. OK. Baudelaire said that the form of a city changes more quickly than the human heart. Hanoi's tunnel houses prove the opposite not out of a simple desire for preservation, but because they ensure family cohesion and the stability of their trade activities. Ban bao! Ban bao! They're the best in town. It's thanks to these tunnel houses that this old quarter still retains all its flavor and vitality.
My name is Philippe Cime. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. I'm in Yongshui in eastern Myanmar, a two-hour flight from Rangoon, the capital. This port town is the main access point for Inle Lake, the country's second largest. 22 kilometers long by 10 kilometers wide, it's home to the Inta, the region's majority ethnic group, numbering an estimated 200,000. 500 years ago, Displaced by tribal wars, the Inta found refuge on the lake and over the centuries developed a way of life in harmony with its waters. Crossing Inlay Lake, which stretches for 116 square kilometers among the Shan Hills, I head to the southern end, to the village of Puk Par. As in all the villages on and around the lake, the Inta have developed water-based economic activities here. But pollution and the influx of tourists have weakened the ecosystem on which their livelihood depends. Houses, businesses, schools, here everything is on stilts and surrounded by water. How do the local people preserve the harmony of their singular way of life? I'm on my way to visit Menge who comes from a long line of farmers and fishermen. She was born here and still lives far from dry land in one of these houses perched on stilts above the water. Hello. Hello. Thank you for welcoming me. You're welcome. My house is made of bamboo. I can see. It's all bamboo. The whole house is made of bamboo. There are about 30 stilts in all supporting the house. They're three meters long and the house is three meters high. I guess the water level changes with the seasons, right? That's right. The water will be up to here soon, and by the end of the rainy season, it can come right up to the upper deck. I see. That's why there are these different levels, the two pontoons and then the stairs. Would you like to see the house? I'd love to. I love this staircase. I'll take my shoes off. Wow. This is my son. Ah, hello. He's a fisherman. Hello. I'm Philippe. Hello. Hello. What are you doing? I'm mending my nets. A huge room. This is the living room. Yeah? We all live here with my son and his wife. And that's the room where everyone sleeps. Oh, right, okay. That's my son and his wife's bed. That's mine. And that's my grandson's bed. Don't the bamboo poles in the water rot? How long do they last? The stilts last about two years. Then we have to replace them. The bamboo partitions last five years. When I renovate my house, I put all my belongings in a pile in the corner, I remove the old bamboo and replace it. So you basically rebuild your house bit by bit? Yes. I use a small axe to cut this pole, say, without touching the partition. Ah, okay, I see. I remove it and I replace it with a new pole. Right, and you can cut it, untie these knots and reassemble it. That's great. Up there too, I replace the bamboo. Right. My son is also a carpenter. He and his friends built the house. The symbolic, religious aspect, the cardinal points, all that, seem to be important in the organization of space here. They are. 
For instance, when we sleep, we face Buddha's altar, so east. I see, to show your respect to Buddha. Yes, because Buddha is sacred. That's why we face the altar. These wood and bamboo houses are proof of the Inta's permanent struggle to make the lake habitable, as if it were a matter of controlling this vast expanse of water. In the village, the houses are arranged parallel to each other, in the manner of crisscrossing streets forming a vast waterway network. But it isn't easy to find your way around this nameless maze. Ong Tu, Menge's son, offers to take me out in his dugout to explore the village and its layout. I was born and raised in this village. Is that a school? Yes, the village school. I went there when I was little. But I had to leave when I was five and start working to support my family. I became a fisherman first, then I learned carpentry. But I've always fished. I'm totally lost now. How do you find your way around? I don't need street names to work out where I am. I know the occupants of every house, so I always find my way around. How many people live here? I'd say 200 families. You associate all the places in the village with people's names? That's amazing. We have to go to the store. There? Yes. This is the first store I've seen. We'll dock alongside there. Thanks. Hello? Hello. You've got everything here. Yes, we have potato chips, oil. Oil, rice, biscuits, noodles. Yes, noodles too. I love these. I eat them all the time. This is great. This is the village's main grocery store, and the people from the neighboring village do their shopping here too. How do you get your supplies? Do you have everything delivered? I get my supplies at the market, then I bring everything back here by dugout. I'm going to get a snack. Okay, great. I don't like that. I'll take this. What is it? Fried rice. Rice? Oh, great. It looks tasty. Okay. Well, I think we're good. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello, Tway. Hello. I'm coming. There, I'm in. We've got to go. I'll be meeting up with Ong Tu again later. Right now, I'm going out to the lake with Tue, his cousin, and her friend, Ken Mar, who are both farmers. The lake governs the Inta's life. It enables them to get around, to transport goods, and above all, to feed themselves. It's hard to imagine agricultural practices in water. And yet the Inta have developed a singular technique to make that possible. Floating gardens, man-made strips of land for vegetable growing. So this is a floating garden? It looks as if it's firmly attached to the ground. Yes, we grow all our vegetables here. Aubergines, tomatoes, cucumbers, and even flowers. It's a skill that's passed down from generation to generation. How do you make these gardens? We collect blocks of turf on the shore, cut them into strips, then line them up. Everyone makes their own plot, 
And then underneath, we add a thick layer of freshwater algae, which enables the roots to go right to the bottom of the lake. If the garden wasn't attached, it would move in the wind, whereas with this system, it can't drift. These floating gardens now cover one quarter of Inlay Lake and represent the Inta people's main source of income. They supply the rest of the country with vegetables. Do we have tomatoes to pick? Yes, it's tomato season right now. They're a bit hard, though. I imagine they'll ripen later. Thank you. No, they're ripe. It's a variety of green tomato. These look good. Yes, perfect. I can see these huge gardens stretching for miles. Who do they actually belong to? They belong to the villages. Everyone owns a plot. But the authorities determine the overall size of the gardens. We're not allowed to go beyond a specific limit. In the middle of the lake, it's forbidden. You must be very proud of your production. Yes, because we don't just produce for ourselves. It's become our main source of income, too. We produce in large quantities, and if I can earn six euros for a big bag, that's great. To get all of these tomatoes to grow, do you need chemical fertilizers or pesticides? We use less pesticide now than we used to. We've reduced its use by about a third. But if we didn't use any, all the vegetables would have black holes in them like this. We're aware pesticides are harmful for man, but without them, we'd lose our entire crop. Hey, we've got quite a few here. Yes, you're right, we have enough. We'll go sell them in the village. Right, we're not going to the market. No, I prefer to sell them in the village. Who wants tomatoes? I do, over here. We're coming, hang on. How many do you want? I'd like a kilo. A kilo. She wants a kilo. Okay, green or red? A mixture. A mixture? Okay. There you go. In fact, this is a home delivery service, but on water. Absolutely. Do you see water as something you have to constantly make concessions to, or is it more of an ally? We're tied to the lake like a baby to its mother. I can't imagine living without the water. I can't earn a living or get around without it. Just seeing the lake fills me with joy. After hours out on the water, I now understand the Inta's intimate relationship with the lake. For me, water is an obstacle, whereas here, it's what unites the whole community. A key element of this union are the dugouts. Fitted with outboard motors or oars, they're everywhere. Going in all directions, they leave their wake all over the surface, yet the lake remains impassive. Ong Tu needs to repair his dugout before going fishing. I accompany him to his neighborhood workshop. Hi, Hi Hello. <laughs> You're building a new dugout. Uh, yes, to carry passengers. Yeah. How long does it take to make a dugout like this? It takes a week to make the basic structure and about a month to finish it completely. Seeing as you order the wood in, I guess it costs you a fair amount to start with. Oh yes, a lot. It's about $1,500 per cubic meter. And so how much does a dugout like this cost? $2,500 without the motor. That's a considerable sum for a family. For sure. 
Okay. You're mixing it. This recipe has been in my family forever. We mix three ingredients, sap, sand, and coir. That's a huge pestle. Let's paint. I love this. I love this kind of work. What do people mainly order these days? Dugouts for fishing or dugouts to transport tourists? I make three sorts, for fishing, agriculture and tourism. And in the past few years, have you seen a change in demand? Yes, absolutely. Since Myanmar opened up, we've been selling more and more dugouts for tourism. A lot of travel agencies and hotel owners are buying dugouts to hire them out. Isn't there a danger this demand will change the way the Inta people live on the lake? Let's say, so far, the growth in tourism has been beneficial for us. But consumption is increasing and everything is becoming expensive. Prices have doubled. The increase in tourism, the expansion of agricultural land and global warming all impact the lake's fragile ecosystem. Right, let's go. The Inta have a unique way of fishing, but their livelihood is threatened by falls in the water level to a mere two meters deep in the dry season. Nevertheless, Ong Tu and his uncle continue to fish. It's really amazing because I can barely stand. And there you are, setting up the nets and rowing at the same time. It's easy. It's easy for you, not for me. <laughs> this is an ancient technique for trapping fish. My grandfather taught me. It's passed down from generation to generation. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> I caught a fish. Ah, uh, yes, I can see it. I'm happy when a fish gets caught in my nets. I love it. There are far fewer now than there used to be. We catch two or three kilos a day. Before it was 20 or 30 kilos. Why have things changed? Why are there fewer fish? It's because of the fall in the water level. Do some fishermen have to find other sources of income then? Yes, of course. We have to do other things. We take tourists out for rides in our dugouts, for instance. Inlay Lake is a place where man, nature, and agriculture have long existed in harmony. But this unique ecosystem is now under threat. The lake is drying up, shrinking in size, and becoming increasingly polluted. It's vital the community wakes up and takes action. The venerable Sandardika has used his authority as a Buddhist monk to fight for environmental change for several years now. You yourself are Inta. You were born here. How have you seen the lake change? You know, I grew up here in a village on the lake. I can clearly remember when I was small that the water was turquoise. It was so pure you could see through it. We even used to drink it. The water is so full of chemicals now, we wouldn't even dare rinse our hands in it. To help me understand the other danger threatening the lake, Sundar Dika tells me we have to go into the forest. According to him, intensified logging has seriously diminished its protective role toward the lake. With no trees to hold the water back, sediment flows in ever greater quantities into the rivers feeding the lake, gradually reducing its depth. God, it's pouring. In just a few seconds, we've seen tons and tons of earth pouring into the water. How is this possible? It is because of deforestation and slash-and-burn techniques. 
Now when it rains, the soil isn't held in place by the forest. Is this deforestation due to intensive agriculture or are there other factors as well? There are several causes. Since our grandparents' day, the population has risen sharply. We need more agricultural land to feed everyone, as well as more wood to build houses. This is on top of the El Niño effect. Rainfall has increased significantly. The plants suffer and end up dying. But are the local residents supporting you in your initiative? What has to happen is for all the people living on and around the lake to get together and replant the forest. It is the only way we will protect the lake. And for this, I've set up an organization with young volunteers. Little by little, we're getting there. Thank you so much. Sandar Dika has come up with all sorts of initiatives to involve the villagers in the lake's preservation. These include collecting the different types of waste that are building up on its surface. What types of waste are polluting the lake? Plastic bags, water hyacinths, and also waste from the floating gardens. The tourists leave a lot of trash behind, but so do the locals. During the cleanup campaigns, the custom is for each family to send a volunteer to help clear the waste. It's obvious the lake is changing very quickly. I was wondering if there was a real awareness among the local population or not. Yes, of course. Inta means children of the lake. The lake is our mother. That means we cannot survive without it. We owe it everything. The Inta's special relationship with the lake influences every aspect of their lives, including their beliefs. Predominantly Buddhist, they also worship the lake spirit, one of the 37 gnats of the ancient animist tradition. Today is the start of the Fong Dao O Pagoda's annual festival. It is the most important religious event of the year, and I'm lucky enough to be here. <laughs> I meet up with Anne, a local hotel owner who's very involved in her community. This is very beautiful. Did you do all of this? Yes. On the first day of the festival, I make an offering to Buddha. And I offer a full meal to all my relatives, friends, colleagues and employees. The festival has existed for 400 years, and my family has always participated in the ceremony. This festival is an occasion for great popular rejoicing, isn't it? People have been arriving since dawn for the ceremony. Yes, there are a lot of people. 98% of Inta are Buddhist. You know, by following Buddha, we will be rewarded at the moment of reincarnation. All the lake's residents gather for this week-long festival. Statues of Buddha are taken out of the pagoda and transported by boat from village to village, so associating this celebration with that of the water spirit. Do you think the life of the Inta is inseparable from the life of the lake? For us, it's obvious. This lake is our land. My home is here. It's the same thing for all the Inta, even those who have moved elsewhere. The lake is always in our hearts. The 
the Inta are known as the children of the lake for good reason. They contribute fully to its beauty. The daily activities which they learn in childhood and pass on from generation to generation merge with the lake, making them one and the same. With the lake more and more affected by environmental and economic change, this unity is now under threat. Will the Inta preserve this balance? Such is their grace as they glide across the lake's water. I'm more than certain that they will. Right, I think I'll get some candy. Which is the good candy? Fantastic. This looks great. We'll have these. Do you like really spicy things or not too much? Spicy. I knew it. Yeah. I can't eat spicy food. Ah, uh, it doesn't agree with me either. Nah, we're the same. <laughs> My name is Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in how architecture shapes and defines our lifestyles. I'm taking you with me to explore some of the most unusual living environments on the planet, to better understand what's behind them and share what they have to offer. I'm in Nepal, in Mustang District, northwest of Kathmandu. It's here that the citadel of Lomantang sits on a plateau at an altitude of 4,000 meters. The walled town was founded by a Tibetan king, Amepal, in the late 14th century. It lies on the Salt Road, once an important trade route linking the plateaus of Tibet to the valley of the river Ganges. Formerly the capital of the kingdom of Mustang, Lo Mantong is now totally cut off from the rest of the world, lost in the solitude of the Himalayas. Despite the altitude, the extreme cold, the raging winds, and the vast distances separating them from civilization, 800 people live here all year round. They are the Lobas. The town is a two-hour helicopter flight from Kathmandu. It would have taken me three days to get here by car. I wonder how the Lobas managed to live their daily lives here in total isolation. Bathed by an early spring light and surrounded by snow-covered mountains, Lu Montang seems intact, preserved as though the harshness of the elements had no hold over it. I head to the entrance of the town to meet one of its inhabitants. I want to find out how daily life is set up within its walls. Namaste. Namaste. Hello. Ah, namaste. Welcome to Lomantong. Let me take you to my home. Thank you. Let's go. Karma Angel Gurung has always lived in Lomantang, like the majority of inhabitants. He rears yaks, horses and goats, and lives in one of the town's oldest houses. The streets are incredibly narrow. Yes, and there are lots of them with very high walls to protect us from the wind. In Mustang district, the winds can blow at over 70 kilometers an hour. The outer wall, called Chagri, also gives the town its shape. Most of the houses back onto it and are not allowed to be built higher than the wall. Karma takes me through the maze of streets which he knows like the back of his hand. Here we are. This is my house. It's really beautiful. According to Tibetan tradition, 
We decorate houses with several colors, yellow for wisdom, white for compassion, and blue for protection. And the green, what does that represent? Oh, nothing at all. I just added it because it looks nice. Let's go inside. We store our food downstairs, our grain and the meat we dry. And we live upstairs, where it's warmer. Philippe, this is my wife, Tashi Agmo Gurung. Namaste. Have you always lived in Lomandang? Yes, I was born and raised here. And the town hasn't changed a bit. It's still protected by its walls. It has survived the test of time because everyone has joined together in preserving its structure and its resources. The buildings of Lomantang are well preserved, but has there been much change in the lifestyle of the inhabitants? Yes, there have been changes. We only have the strict minimum here, and it's hard to make a living. So in the winter, the youngsters go down into the city to open stores and earn money before coming back here with the things we lack. Before, in the winter, the Lobas used to leave their town and go down onto the plains to trade. In a way, young men and women are continuing the tradition, which keeps the town stocked up. I've never left here, not even in winter. When the temperature gets too low, I drink a lot of hot tea. It's butter tea. We add salt to it to give us strength. <laughs> You're stronger afterwards. Yes. Thanks. Go ahead. Taste my butter tea. It's very different. <laughs> True. It takes some getting used to. Surrounded by the high peaks of the Himalayas, Lomantang doesn't benefit from the monsoon like the rest of Nepal. A climatic specificity that limits agriculture to one harvest a year, mainly grains like wheat, barley, and buckwheat. The rearing of yaks, horses, and goats completes the Loba's meager resources. In this desert at altitude, rain is scarce, so water management needs to be strictly controlled to have enough for household purposes and to irrigate the fields. Inside the town, this vital resource is distributed via an ingenious system of water conduits. Karma's son, Tsuong, is one of the townspeople who keeps the system running smoothly. Lu Montong is located close to a spring. I guess it's a very precious resource. Our water comes from the peaks of the Himalayas. But it's very scarce, so we have to be extremely careful with it. The town's water supply is managed by a group of six people, and I'm one of them. It's my job to make sure the water is distributed correctly. Today we're directing towards that land there. But in a few days' time, we'll redirect it elsewhere. If the water level drops, I have to quickly find out what's causing it. Someone might be diverting it, or an object might be blocking the conduits. The town needs a regular supply of water because we use it to wash our clothes and dishes. The conduits are also crucial if ever there's an outbreak of fire. The streets follow the slope of the terrain and the network of conduits so that inhabitants have easy access to water. 
Any surplus is collected in a reservoir and filtered for drinking water. The Lobas consider this resource as a common asset. And this water ensures the sustainability of Lomantan. When you live in a place as isolated as this, everyone has to contribute to preserving the town. The two most important things we need to preserve in Lomantong are water and the walls. If I notice that part of the wall near my house is damaged, I repair it. This wall was first built in the late 14th century to protect us from attack coming from China or Ladakh. Fortunately, we're not at war anymore, but the wall is still vital to the town. When there's an earthquake, it's the wall that keeps the houses standing. So that's why all the inhabitants maintain it. Repairing the clay brick wall requires a simple technique which Tsuwang masters well. Like all the inhabitants of Lo Mantang, he does maintenance work several times a year. It's just earth and water. Yes, earth which I collected from a field. I just have to make sure there's no straw or stones in it. Go on, Philip. Try laying a brick. OK, this one? Careful, it's heavy. So the bricks are simply left to dry? Yes, because at this altitude, wood is scarce, so we can't fire the bricks. That's why we've always used this technique. Once dry, we shape them. Yeah. And now you fill in the gaps. Yes. We cover them with clay. You have to pat it in and smooth it quickly or it doesn't hold. This is really the original technique. This technique works perfectly well, so we continue to use it. Plus, we want to keep the wall in its original state. I see. Well, it's starting to hold, but there's still lots to do. <laughs> yes, I'll carry on tomorrow. In Lu Montan, there are walls everywhere, thick yet fragile at the same time, casting intangible shadows and colors that change as the sun turns in the sky. The walls symbolize the Loba's struggle to keep their culture alive while confronted by the short-lived nature of the clay and the ravages of time. This evening, Karma has invited me to dinner at his house, a chance for me to see what the Lobas eat and how they cook it. In their own way, the dishes of Mustang reflect the harshness of life in this arid, barren land. Is this the only heated room? Hardly anyone has electricity here. It's not like in your country. We don't have radiators. At this altitude, there's no wood or coal to heat the homes, so we use yak dung. We leave it to dry and then feed the stove with it. So we spend a lot of time in this room. We've adapted to our climate. I have something to show you. It's a prayer wheel. It contains mantras, the teachings of Buddha. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. The rolls of mantras are inside. That's right. There are lots of them. Ah! It's very filling. It fills you up. It's a traditional dish, mashed buckwheat. It's really good. You add some yak butter. 
Oh, right, some butter. And you make little balls. Like this? Go on. Tuck in. Okay, I make little balls and dip them in the sauce, right? Yep. What do you think? Mmm, really good. Okay. Okay. We'll finish dinner, and then it's time for bed. Okay, very well. Karm is right. At 4,000 meters altitude, the day's activities take their toll. Fatigue soon overcomes the body, despite the loba's incredible robustness and resilience. In this walled town, high up in the mountains, religion has a central place in life. All Lobas are practicing Tibetan Buddhists. Temples and other religious buildings are the keystone of their culture. Yet they have left them to fall into disrepair due to a lack of means. But restoration work is finally underway, thanks to financial backing from a foundation in the United States and the skills of expert restorer Luigi Fieni. I didn't expect to run into an Italian in Lo Montang. How did you end up working here? I'm kind of here by chance. Really? In 1999, I thought I'd be here working on a project for a few months. But it turned into 19 years, and I'm still here. <laughs> That's quite a long time. It is. It's part of my life now. I get the impression that the buildings require a lot of maintenance. They're all built in clay, which is a material that needs constant upkeep. Every year they paint their houses with a layer of liquid clay to protect them from the winds and the rain. On the top of the weather, there are unpredictable events like the earthquake of 2015. Did it destroy a lot of buildings here? Quite a few. The structures are in clay, which absorbs most of the shocks, but the houses and buildings are full of cracks. They've been weakened. Exactly. What led you to start restoring the monastery in particular? When the foundation came here, they asked the Lobas what they needed. They thought they would say a hospital, a school, etc. But their answer was completely different. They said, if you really want to help us, our culture is found on religion. So start by restoring our monasteries. At first, it was a nightmare, but it has turned into a real gift because helping the people restore their buildings and safeguard their culture is an incredible experience. Luigi is teaching the inhabitants how to conserve their architectural heritage. He shows me the work going on in the Tubshen Temple, the largest of the four temples in the town. This is the entrance to the monastery. What are they up there, dragons? They're lions. They're found in a lot of monasteries because they protect them from evil spirits and demons. Will they let us in? Oh, there's a good chance. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Wow, it's really magnificent. Yes, this room is really vast. It's amazing. When was it built? It was consecrated in 1472. It was the main monastery of the Lo Manthang community. There were several religious buildings here, but the most important was Thubchen. When we first came in here, everything was covered in varnish, paint, and clay had run from the ceiling, and most of the paintings were very badly damaged. You see that Buddha? It had lost its knees. We started by working on the existing original paint, and we taught the locals how to restore it. 
But when they saw the results, they said, OK, it's beautiful, it's very colourful, but there are things missing. The knees, the hands, the feet. So we can't pray to it. So now we're restoring the whole thing and replacing the missing pieces because the locals want a real living monastery and not a museum. To allow lay people into this holy place, a monk had to perform a ceremony before work could begin. Using a mirror, he captured the soul of each divinity present in the frescoes. This strange procedure deconsecrates the images, so they are no longer spiritual and no longer inhabited by the divine. They're simply material traces, a clever way of authorizing the inhabitants, and notably women who are considered impure, to touch the works, remove the pigments, and proceed with their restoration. Yandoka. <laughs> Bonjour. Namaste. Namaste. Restoring a monastery like this is a mammoth task. It's true, it's a huge amount of work. We started by cleaning all the columns and the ceiling. We followed that up by cleaning the walls before starting the first work on the paintings. We're so lucky to have been taught the techniques of restoration. Now we can protect the heritage and culture of our town by ourselves. Before becoming a restorer, what was your job? Before starting in the monastery as a painter, I worked mainly in the fields. These days, I do both. I go out early in the morning to feed the cattle, and I spend the rest of the time in here. The way the Lobas have taken their cultural and religious heritage into their own hands is remarkable. This temple is their most precious monument. They decided to make it their own and restore it in their own way so as to remain its masters and keep it alive. The town will therefore remain a religious capital and a pilgrimage destination for Buddhists. Paradoxically, religion now brings thousands of pilgrims to Lomontang, where in the 7th century, it was the need for solitude and silence that led Tibetan Buddhism to establish itself here. One of the monks, Fungchuk, offers to show me what's left of Konchuk Ling Cave, carved out of the rock some 800 years ago. So three centuries before the founding of Lomantang, holy men were already coming here to meditate. The people of Lomantang weren't the first to settle up here in the mountains. Here there are thousands of caves where men came in search of isolation. The cave we're going to is very difficult to reach. The horse can't go any further. We'll continue on foot. The climb is exhausting, and the lack of oxygen is cruelly felt. But walking, with my body in pain and my breath faltering, brings me immeasurable pleasure as we near the summit. Here we are, Philippe, at Konchok Ling Cave. We made it. Are you OK? Fine. As you can see, the walls of the cave are covered in 13th century paintings. They're of the Mahasiddhas, mythical Indian figures that influenced Tibetan Buddhism. The Konchok Ling paintings prove that in the 11th century, the great accomplished lived here. It's the perfect place of isolation to achieve awakening. 
These wall paintings from bygone days tell us of the fervor of the cave's first occupants, their quest to approach the divine and to inhabit these mountains spiritually. It's magnificent. Does living at such an altitude develop a certain type of culture and spirituality? This region was Buddhist long before the kingdom of Lomontong was founded. The monks lived in caves dug out by ancient populations. Mm. Most of them were very difficult to reach as they are situated up in the middle of the cliffs or mountains. The Himalayas are the expression of the divine. They have a paramount place in Buddhism. Ancient texts mention the Himalayas as a unique and holy place, the preferred place of spiritual masters. The very starting point of Buddhism is meditation. The closer one gets to the sky, the closer one is to the gods. Looking out from the top of this mountain, at high altitude, I seem to better understand what ties the Lobas to this beautiful yet demanding land, isolation. Not as a constraint, but as a way of finding a place in this vast landscape, suspended in time, of forgetting oneself in order to find oneself. A way of living and meditating, which brings back to me what Jean-Jacques Rousseau called the pure sentiment of existence, the discovery of one's own presence in the evidence of the world. My name is Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in the ways in which architecture provides a glimpse into the way we live. Let's explore some of the world's most unique homes, understand their significance, and experience the cultural wealth that these locations have to offer. Today, I'm going to the Fujian province on the southeast coast of China home of the Hakka people. Their ancestors, the Han, migrated south nearly a dozen centuries ago when northern China was invaded by nomadic peoples coming from Central Asia. In this mountainous region of fertile plains, the Hakka people came together to defend the land on which they depended for their survival. They created a new type of dwelling unlike any other, known as the Tulo, a rural fortress-like structure with only one entrance and few windows, in which their communities could thrive. Hongjun has always lived in the family Tulo. He now oversees and carefully maintains the property. Hongjun! Hello! Hello, Philippe. I'll come down and join you. Hello and welcome to my Tulo. It was built by my ancestors in 1842 and has been my family's home ever since. So, the same family has lived in this Tulo for the last century and a half. It is Chinese tradition for Tulos to always be inhabited by the same families. I live here with my wife and son. I'll show you around. Follow me. 
Two loaves are made of wood and earth. As you can see, it's very beautiful. It's magnificent. Families primarily live on the ground floor of a tulu. That is where we eat, where children can play, and where adults can come together for important gatherings. How many units are there exactly? There are more than 140. This must be an extremely compact residence. That's my apartment. This one here? Yes, this is where I live. I see. This is the kitchen. The other rooms are upstairs. There are four stories. So the apartment has a vertical structure rather than a horizontal one. Yes, that's right. This is a vertical design. There are four exterior staircases. Each one leads to all four floors, and every room is accessible by stairs. Two lows are partitioned vertically for each and every family, from the ground floor to the very top. That's absolutely amazing. I've never seen an apartment building layout like this one. Two lows remind me of a mandarin orange. Each family has their own identical vertical slice. It's a very egalitarian system. It was passed down from our ancestors. As a member of the Hakka community, I can say that we came here to live together. Were you born in this Tulo? This is where I was born and raised. Before it was left to Hongjun, the family Tulo had been passed down over 22 generations. Less than a century ago, it was home to nearly 500 members of his extended family, but today there are only 20 permanent residents. Many of his relatives now work in one of China's many major cities, or in Taiwan, and only visit on special occasions like the Chinese New Year. I encountered very few people from Hongjun's generation in the Tulo. Only a cousin, a few children, and for the most part, aunts and uncles. But for Su Hongjun and his wife Ju, who works in one of the most famous Tulus in the region as a tour guide, the unique dwellings are ideally designed. Follow me, Philippe. It's this way. This is one of four shared staircases. This is the only way we can go. There are two on this side and two more on the other side. Food is kept on the second floor in a cool, dry area. These are all large pantries used for storing food. There are 34 in all. We keep all kinds of food in these storage rooms, which are made of pine and fir timber. They're kept airtight and are well insulated. This is our storage room. Have a look. So this is where you keep everything. Everything here is kept well organized, each room is well insulated, and is mostly used for storing food. Here are some peanuts. That's right, we harvest them ourselves. First they're washed, and then we store them here. They keep for a very long time, because the room is well sealed. There's no ventilation, which keeps the food from going bad. That was the second floor, and now we're heading up to the third. Let me show you the bedrooms. All the bedrooms are located on the third floor. There are four stories in all. The view from up here is incredible. Yes, it is. You can see the whole Tulo. There's a panoramic view. And this is where we sleep. 
So this is a bedroom. Come in. Thank you. The room is cool in the summer and warm in the winter. The bed is here, and the closet is over there. There are two windows which bring in fresh air for a better night's sleep. This room seems much smaller than the one I saw on the first floor. Mm, that's right. The ground floor is most spacious because it has to support the weight of the entire structure. The walls on the first floor are 1.8 meters thick. They're 1.6 on the second, 1.4 on the third, and 1.2 meters on the top floor. Each floor is 20 centimeters smaller than the one below it. The rooms get smaller the higher up you go, which strengthens the whole structure and makes it highly resistant. I'm beginning to understand the joys of living in such a unique environment. With its warm wood and circular floor plan, one has the impression of being in an open-air setting. Though it may seem like a fortress closed to the outside world, the architecture is ideal for harmonious communal living. This is another breathtaking view, with a mountain in the distance and the surrounding trees. The mountain behind the Tulo resembles an eagle with its wings outstretched. This is all very surprising because from the outside, the Tulo appears to be an enclosed structure. But once inside, you feel very much connected to the surrounding environment. Indeed you do. On the outside, the Tulo just looks like a giant fortified castle. But once inside, you realize that this is a warm and inviting place. That's what makes Tulo so unique and mysterious. From the 12th century to the 1960s, the Hakka people built thousands of tulos. Today, there are 3,700 in the Fujian region alone. They come in all shapes and sizes, round, square, rectangular, the modest and the imposing. The Fujian tulo had been a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2008 for its remarkable architecture. Although they may look like impenetrable fortresses from the outside, the monumental structures were built using the rammed earth technique, which has been around since ancient times. Earth is mixed with a hodgepodge of raw materials and compacted so tightly that once dried, the walls become highly resistant. But building a tulo is an enormous undertaking, one that requires hundreds of laborers over a period of several years. Is this the base on which the tulo was built? Yes, this is the tulo's foundation. It is 13 meters thick. Records left by our ancestors suggest that this used to be marshland. The foundation had to be deep enough to support a structure as large and imposing as a tulo. Here, you can see the huge stones that make up the foundation walls. And the mortar holds it all together. What exactly is it made out of? Clay and sanhetu were used between the stones. Sanhetu is a mixture of three materials, sand, brown sugar and lime. On top, the sanhetu was mixed with sticky rice and eggs, which was then left to ferment before it was applied to the wall as a sealant. That's a rather unusual technique. I've never heard of that before. It's usually much more common to use lime or cement to reinforce the walls. I really like the detail of this little wood joint in particular. Wood joints help make the walls waterproof. Whenever it rains, the joints keep moisture from spreading between the stone foundation and the rammed earth walls, thereby reinforcing the whole structure. The walls are very durable. They are able to withstand earthquakes and are also wind resistant and fireproof. I find the circular shape to be quite mysterious. According to historical records, a massive earthquake once struck China and many homes were destroyed. That's when our ancestors had the idea to build round structures that could withstand natural disasters. The circular shape means the space is always well lit. Round tulos have virtually no blind spots, which makes it easier to see the enemy coming. I can't imagine its circular shape was only intended for defense purposes. The circle is also a symbol of wholeness, eternity, unity, and community. I suppose that symbolic dimension is also very important. 
Yes, you're right, Philippe. In addition to its ability to withstand earthquakes and enemy attacks, the circular structure represents harmony and unity. The circle is a powerful symbol in the Hakka community. The magic of Tulos is also enhanced by the ways in which the structures were thoughtfully designed to interact with the natural environment. They were designed according to the rules of Feng Shui. The art of Feng Shui dates back several thousand years. It is a system that aims to harmonize the flow of energy in a given environment to improve the health and prosperity of its inhabitants. A Feng Shui master determined the precise location of Su Hongjun's Tulo, as well as its orientation, the location of the entrance, and even the furniture arrangement. Today, a Feng Shui expert has come to introduce me to the ancient art. He uses a traditional compass known as a luopan, a mysterious but widely used hand instrument. This luopan is composed of three dials. The first is the earth plate, which was used to determine the position of the mountain behind the tulo. The second represents mankind, and the third is the heaven plate. In contrast to the way spaces are usually designed nowadays, you design spaces organically and symbolically. Everything is interconnected and has its own unique meaning. Yes, that's what Feng Shui is all about. Being in harmony with nature is of utmost importance, as are the five elements that surround us. Wood, fire, earth, metal and water. There should be balance between those five elements. For instance, if there is a mountain which represents wood and wood generates fire, there should be an interaction between the two. Water in or around the Tulo represents incoming wealth, and behind it there is a forest-covered mountain. Those elements are necessary to generate the flow of positive energy. And what do you do exactly to pinpoint those energies? Feng Shui is very mysterious. It is something that cannot be seen or touched. It takes many, many years of experience before one can harness those energies. I think cooking outside is very practical, not only because of lingering smells and temperature control, but also because it's more convivial. Yes, you can chat with everyone while you cook. Traditionally, we never close the front door when we eat indoors. Can you guess why? It's because the Hakka people like to invite others to see what we're having. That way, if they want to join us, they are more than welcome to. So the door is always kept open during meals. Cheers! Cheers! <laughs> It's very sweet. It's made from sticky rice. I'll give it a try. And what's this, bamboo? These are wild bamboo shoots. They come from the mountain. Mm, this is really delicious. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have Tulos changed much since you were little? China has undergone so many changes. Families are very different in today's world. People are having less children, fewer Chinese are living in rural areas. Young people often go off to work in the city. What do you imagine for the future of Tulos? In my father's generation, it wasn't unusual to have a dozen brothers and sisters. In my generation, it's common to have three or four. My son is part of the one-child generation. We would like our son to work in the city because that's where he'll be able to make a much better living, but we do hope that one day he will return home and settle down here. Nowadays, with some of the more touristic Tulos, young people are returning home to work in their native region as a tour guide, for example, and are starting to make a much better living. <laughs> 
This morning, Sucho wants to show me the impact of tourism on Tulo living. She takes me along the very same road she follows every day on her way to work in one of the most famous Tulos of all, Seng Shenlu. For many years, Senchen Lu had been a must-see destination for tourists, the majority of whom are Chinese and who come from all over the country. Built by a wealthy tobacco merchant in the early 20th century, the structure is majestic. With its series of concentric rings, five floors, and its 222 apartments that can hold nearly 1,000 residents. There are 42 families that live in this Tulo. So around 200 people still live here. That's right, more than 200. As an additional source of income, and because there are so many tourists, each family opened a small shop like this one. The kitchen area has been turned into a boutique that only sells local goods. This looks like tea. That's tea from the valley. And this is honey. Yes, that's wild honey. You have to watch your step. Go ahead. Only a short decade ago, Tulos were largely unknown to the Chinese and risked being deserted. Today they have found new life through the explosion of mass tourism. But at what cost? The average income of the Hakka community has doubled in just five years. Although the revenue is being used to fund the maintenance of certain Tulos, what were once havens of peace are now being swarmed with the buzzing of tourists. <laughs> In a rapidly changing China, I wonder what the future has in store for the unique dwellings. Are they destined to become museums as mere relics of the past? Or will they be able to draw a new generation of young people by adapting to the demands of modern convenience? Strolling through the Fujian province, I notice that modern concrete housing has popped up everywhere and even extend up to many Tulos. And yet, far from disappearing from the landscape, Tulos seem to stand out more than ever before as bastions of resistance. Sucho showed me where I could find a more modern Tulo, nestled in the hills. This is absolutely incredible. I've never seen anything like it. This is a Tulo. Inside, another Tulo. The new in the old. They're both completely different, but right away, you can see the similarities in the design and layout of space. There's a central courtyard. Although new materials were used, the traditional organization of space has still been respected. Hakka farmers and their families have been living in the region for more than 29 generations. In recent years, the residents of this Tulo found that their living conditions had become too cramped, and they had a truly unique idea. I meet with one of the residents, Lin Chong. Each family has added a new unit as an extension of the old. I see. So, do the people who live here still use the old Tulo just behind? 
Yes, that's correct. Everyone still lives in the old Tulo. There are about 500 to 600 residents in all. Construction began five or six years ago. Each family paid for the renovations with their own money. Does that mean that you're going to keep building all the way around the Tulo? Construction hasn't started yet, but it soon will. In the end, the new homes will form a circle so that everything is connected. It's nicer that way. This is where I live, in both buildings, on this side and on that one. That one and this one. So this must be the new extension of your home. Come on, have a look inside. Aside from the new interior staircase, the new building is an identical reproduction of the old Tulo made of earth and wood. But the new version was built with brick, glass and metal. On one hand, the use of 21st century materials and furnishings means residents can enjoy modern conveniences. On the other, the Tulo remains true to tradition, with its vertically compartmentalized interiors, inward-facing floor plans, and shared living spaces. As we can see, the common areas are being used in some very interesting ways. At first glance, you can't tell if this is a public or private space. This portable stove has been placed in front of this home, therefore overflowing into the public space, which can be used by everyone. And so there's the issue of what defines the threshold, where one's private property ends and where public property begins. It's clear that these thresholds are permeable. They are constantly changing. The way the space can be experienced is quite fascinating. The inventiveness that allows a structure to evolve over time is a major advantage in ensuring its long-term survival. It becomes an open door to the hopes and dreams of future generations. Lin Chong's son, Lin Min, is no exception. Every weekend, he takes a three-hour train ride from the university town where he studies to return to the family Tulo. Do you prefer to stay in the old Tulo? Yes, I do. I like the atmosphere and the temperature doesn't fluctuate as much as it does in the new house. When you graduate, do you see yourself settling here to start a family? Oh, of course I do. I think that I will eventually come back sooner or later, probably when I'm older. This place is out in the boondocks. I have to go to the city to earn a living. If I had the choice, and if I had the time, I would come home more often. There's nothing better than home. I would never miss a chance to come back for the Chinese New Year because this is where my parents are. The future of the Tulo may lie in its ability to be reinvented by combining the old and the new, and by adapting traditional structures to the demands of modern convenience. The Hakka people continue to keep the Tulo traditions alive. It is an extraordinary way of life, one that has withstood the test of time, and one that will hopefully continue to thrive. <laughs>